Welcome everybody to the Wellman Institute's 10th web talk for 2016 and this is our I think 22nd web talk altogether since we started doing them about a year and a half ago, actually about two years ago now. And today we'll, we'll have Dr. Louis Venters uh, at Francis Marion University speaking about his book, No Jim Crow Church, The History of the South Carolina Baha'i Community. Uh, how do I get this to switch here? I should start briefly by introducing you to the Wilmot Institute. Most of you know this information, so I uh, won't cover it in any great detail. As of January of 2017, next month, the Institute will be 22 years old. We started out by giving a face-to-face -face program called the Spiritual Foundations for Global Civilization, and then we began to do online courses as the software to do these things over the internet gradually improved. We started doing that in 1998, so we've been doing online courses now for a good solid, <clears throat> excuse me, 18 years. To date, we've run a total of 390 courses, and the, the number of registrations have totaled 10,556, according to our database anyway from 116 different countries. Our learners have done all kinds of different things with the information that they have acquired in our courses, giving all kinds of presentations to various groups, um, taught the faith to many different people who are interested in learning uh, more in detail. Uh, and of course now we've moved to some extent beyond just doing our online courses to doing web talks such as this one, we're also doing courses which are primarily oriented around video, which are webinars. You have to pay to join the webinars, of course, but, but they are courses. They do have uh, online discussion afterwards, and they have sometimes have a certain amount of readings to do. And we're now moving in the direction of trying to make our courses available for credit through various university partnerships, which we are actually actively exploring right now. So if you know of any institutions that might be interested in partnering with us, we actually would like to hear about that. I have this slide about Louis, but I think if I can manage this, I will switch to our web page about the book, because here you can see a cover, the cover of his book, No Jim Crow Church, with a photograph of one of the South Carolina Baha'i communities there, right on the cover. Uh, as I said, Louis is an assistant professor at Francis Marion University down in South Carolina. He's a South Carolina native. He's an expert on uh, historical preservation and cultural resource management as well. He's on quite a large number of South Carolina boards of various sort, and his book, which came out as a hardcover, is now coming out in paperback. He's also preparing a second book, which is a more general introduction to the history of the faith in South Carolina, and he's working on a sequel to this particular book that he put out called um, Can't You See the New Day, which will cover the growth of the faith since the beginning of mass teaching in South Carolina in 1968. So that, of course, is a very exciting development that he'll be offering us that as well. That pretty much completes my introduction, so we'll switch over to uh, Louis's camera and uh, his screen, and uh, Louis, take it away. Well, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I um, I like to think I'm enough of an African uh, to know that I should uh, thank my ancestors before any important undertaking. So I'd like to just uh, say a word of dedication um, for uh, Doña Inidia Rinaldi of Colombia and lately um, Tucker, Georgia. Um, Inidia was one of the, the earliest collaborators of what would become the Ruhi Institute in Colombia in the 1970s. And when she and her family moved to the United States, um, she continued uh, to be a real leading exponent of that movement here. Uh, and she passed away uh, just recently in Orlando. So I'd like to thank her for her work and, uh, uh, and dedicate my, my comments today to her. <clears throat> so um, today, um, academic sources uh, and the media recognize the Baha'i Faith as the second largest religion in South Carolina, the only one in the Union where this is the case. And the community is widely respected for its public service radio station and its commitment to education and interfaith dialogue and interracial harmony. Um, and South Carolina Baha'is are one part of a 
a national religious body that's astonishingly uh, diverse. This is uh, this is one uh, one way that the South Carolina community has uh, received recognition just recently. This is a, a, a map um, um, put out by a body that, that Rob happens to have been connected with, but um, I don't think he influenced the findings in any way. Uh, this indicates that the the Baha'i faith is uh, is the only state in the country uh, that the, the that South Carolina is the only state in the country where the Baha'i faith is is the second largest religion, Christianity being the first, of course, everywhere. Um, things were very different here um, when the faith first arrived in South Carolina more than a hundred years ago. Um, when Pearl Dixon, the widow of an African Methodist Episcopal minister in Columbia, the state capital, first heard about the Baha'i faith from two white northerners in 1938, she could hardly believe her ears. In Persia, only a few decades earlier, she learned, a new religious movement had emerged that decreed that it was God's will that all the peoples of the world, whatever their race, religion, or nationality, must embrace each other as members of one family and citizens of a just and peaceful global commonwealth. This meant sooner or later the dismantling of every system that people had devised to take advantage of each other, including the Jim Crow order in the United States. Um, Dixon's grown daughter, Jessie Dixon Ensminger, was initially skeptical. Uh, she said in an interview years later, I had never heard tell of the Baha'i faith before. It sounded like a funny name. Um, but Mrs. Dixon, her mother, um, immediately embraced the new message, invited the northern white women to lead a study class in her home. Um, after a few months of study, uh, Mrs. Ensminger, the daughter, became a Baha'i as well. Um, also in the class were Edward and Luella Moore, uh, a white couple from nearby North Augusta on the border of Georgia, uh, and their grown daughter, Louise Moore Montgomery. Uh, these people who, who met in this study class would remain um, lifelong friends and really became uh, family to each other over, over decades. The, this Columbia Baha'i group that was just emerging was like nothing South Carolina had ever seen before. Uh, this is one image from, I think, about 1945, um, and second from the right is uh, Jesse Ensminger, um, whom uh, later generations of South Carolina Baha'is would all know as Miss Jesse. Um, and behind her partially hidden, the white woman, um, is Luella Moore. Um, and then uh, some people will recognize as well, uh, the gentleman in the background is Louis Gregory um, visiting, visiting this, uh, this small community. As, as this photo gives us an inkling of, in the midst of a society dedicated to preserving the status quo with a long history of publishing, of punishing dissenters, the Columbia Baha'is and their co-religionists in cities and towns across the South were crossing lines of race and class and gender to create a new kind of faith community. In a religion without clergy, men and women Blacks and whites, old and young, northerners and southerners, natives and immigrants, rich and poor, all learn to worship and study and teach and administer their affairs together as equal partners and as intimate friends. And as they work to build their own model of grassroots spiritual democracy, they reached out to leaders of thought, they proclaimed their message through public lectures in the mass media, and they sought to encourage individuals and organizations as their resources would allow that were struggling for civil rights. Their numbers were minuscule. Their methods were hardly flashy. Uh, sometimes they failed to live up to their own ideals, but their work was truly radical, often entailing significant personal risk for both whites and blacks who were involved. Instead of pushing for political or economic equality, like most other organizations that were concerned with racial justice, 
The Baha'is were specializing in what scholars and activists have called social equality. That is, the kind of interracial association that isn't just coalition building, that's not just focused on one particular issue, that isn't occasional or partial, but is rather about creating real love and fellowship and bonds of shared identity across the lines that divide people. As I understand it, this idea of social equality is at the heart of Martin Luther King's ideal of the beloved community that he said was the, the ultimate goal of the civil rights movement. And W.E.B. Du Bois speaks to its importance in, in the souls of black folk in 1903. And here's just a, a relatively short passage from the souls of black folk. But forgive the, the somewhat dated language, but you'll get the gist. In a world where it means so much to take a man by the hand and sit beside him, to look frankly into his eyes and feel his heart beating with red blood, in a world where a social cigar or a cup of tea together means more than legislative halls and magazine articles and speeches, one can imagine the consequences of the almost utter absence of such social amenities between estranged races, whose separation extends even to parks and streetcars. In other words, if blacks and whites don't really know each other as friends, don't socialize together, don't learn to feel a basic spiritual kinship with each other, then how can they possibly understand each other and communicate effectively enough to heal the wounds of the body politic? The Baha'is approach was hardly confrontational. As a matter of principle, they refused to resort to violence or to associate with anybody who did. Um, they refrained from political partisanship. They tried scrupulously to obey the law, even if they didn't agree with some particular part of it. Yet even this small group, really, only 200 members or so on the rolls by the late 1960s, even a group this small, was apparently a grave threat to the Jim Crow order in South Carolina and to the Protestant orthodoxy that it was all wrapped up with. Um, Baha'is were targets of ostracism, slander, intimidation, sometimes violence by neighbors, uh, local and state officials, the FBI, conservative clergymen, and the Ku Klux Klan. Um, I'll give just a few examples. Um, perhaps the most harrowing is uh, in, in 1911, the faith's first adherent in South Carolina, an African-American lawyer in Charleston named Alonzo Twine, was condemned to a pestilential insane asylum on charges of religious obsession. He died there three years later um, in this building, the Parker Building, portions of which are still standing in Columbia. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a rather grainy image. Um, he was alone, broken, um, afflicted with a horrible nutritional deficiency called pellagra, and deprived of his Baha'i books by a meddling minister. Um, a few more examples. In the late 1930s, local police in North Augusta shut down Baha'i meetings at the home of a black washerwoman on account of, quote, too many colored people gathering together. In the 1950s in Colombia, police broke up a 19-day feast in the home of a white Baha'i because neighbors complained that there were blacks in attendance. In Greenville, uh, about the same time, the Klan burned a cross in the front yard of a white Baha'i for the same reason. Um, in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, uh, also in Greenville, um, both a black building contractor and a white attorney uh, uh, were each blacklisted in their professions because of their associations with the Baha'i community. Um, in fact, there was a state legislator in, in the 1950s in, who was an, a neighbor of Baha'is in Greenville who organized a petition drive. He was going to send this petition to the legislature to get the Baha'i faith banned because um, Baha'is, he said, were communists and atheists and um, NAACP race mixers. Um, 
so to, to the enforcers of white supremacy in South Carolina, evidently Du Bois's cup of tea together, so to speak, really did mean more than legislative halls and magazine articles and speeches, or or at least uh, at least as much as those. Um, by the 1960s, um, decades worth of effort to build interracial fellowship in the most inauspicious circumstances had achieved some results. Um, as I said, about 200 Baha'is around the state representing a virtual cross-section of the population, uh, six local spiritual assemblies that were linked to each other in a relatively effective regional administrative structure. Uh, this image, by the way, is um, of a winter school, uh, of Southeast Regional Winter Program 1961-62 at Penn Center, uh, an important uh, center of, of black education on St. Helena Island, South Carolina. Um, there was also a growing awareness of the faith around the state, um, including of its interracial character among leaders of thought uh, through extensive use of the mass media. And it was on this foundation that was um, painstakingly built over 60 years that the Baha'is set out to take their message uh, to towns and hamlets across the state and uh, in other states of the Deep South. Through outreach efforts in the 1970s and the 1980s, some 20,000 South Carolinians, most of them black, but also whites and members of the state's almost invisible Native American communities, became Baha'is. Um, one non-Baha'i scholar of religion has recently termed this the Carolinian Pentecost, uh, which I confess I, I like very much. This is um, this is um, sorry, not not great images. Um, it's the best I could reproduce them. Um, but this is pages from the American Baha'i, uh, the National Baha'i newspaper, um, just with some photographs um, from the the first foray into this large scale growth in 1970. Um, and I think, as best you can see, uh, some of the faces. Um, are really, really quite bright. Um, you, you get a get a lot from these images, I believe. <laughs> the experience in South Carolina um, launched the U.S. Baha'i community on a difficult and decades-long effort to sustain and manage and replicate large-scale growth of the faith and to embrace new forms of cultural and socioeconomic diversity. This was an immensely enriching period uh, during which the challenges associated with rapid growth in South Carolina significantly altered the identity and structures and aspirations of the national Baha'i community, even though it as a, as a national community already had a great deal of experience compared to other religious bodies in promoting interracial harmony, the South Carolina experience that started about 1968 uh, really took it up a notch. Um, indeed, given the emphasis that the faith's global leadership had consistently placed on building a community free of racial prejudice in the U.S., it's no exaggeration to say that the experience in South Carolina was one of the most significant developments in the first century of the Baha'i faith in this country. As important as it was, what happened in South Carolina uh, starting in the late 1960s remains rather poorly understood among American Baha'is in general. And among scholars of, of the faith, it's, it's really received very little attention. I'll just uh, mention two misconceptions that my work aims to dispel. Um, one pretty maddening thing that I sometimes hear from Baha'is about this post-1968 period is that the teaching in South Carolina itself was great, but there was no consolidation afterwards. That's a, a refrain that I, I, I've heard many times. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, there were, in fact, Herculean efforts to consolidate the gains, to uh, to foster Baha'i community life and the development of local spiritual assemblies. This is, 
These are members of, of one local spiritual assembly from Sumter, South Carolina. That's about 1973, I believe. Um, um, there were constant, persistent efforts to learn about what was happening in South Carolina, to, to learn about how to carry the process forward and to involve um, more and more people um, in, in the work. Just a couple more images. Um, this is a, a, a state bulletin from 1974 outlining the, the goals for the, the five-year teaching plan for the state. Um, at the bottom, the image uh, that's, that's printed is, um, is uh, two, two administrative um, leaders in the state. Um, on the bottom right is uh, Alberta Dees who was secretary of the regional teaching committee and um, to her left is uh, Dr. Sarah Martin Pereira who was a member of the Continental Board of Counselors and I've pointed this out in another recent presentation they're holding hands I think that's uh, really emblematic of the kind of bonds of love and unity that people really were very conscious of trying to create um, as, as the faith grew and consolidated itself um, and I would point out, too, that the Universal House of Justice makes very clear in a work that it commissioned um, uh, more than a decade ago now called Century of Light, that this experience in South Carolina, along with that from a number of countries around the world in similar circumstances, contributed directly to the elaboration of a new strategy or framework for sustainable growth that Baha'i communities worldwide, including here in the United States, have been implementing since the mid-1990s. Um, as you can imagine, this is, this is a very big subject, and uh, as Rob mentioned, it's the, the main subject of my research um, going forward. Another thing I sometimes hear about the Carolinian Pentecost, I'm just going to use that phrase since it's come, come, uh, come across my desk, I really, I, I'm, I'm becoming attached to it, uh, is that it came out of thin air. There were no local spiritual assemblies in South Carolina prior to the growth campaigns. Uh, the work was mainly done by people from outside the state who only came for a short time and then they left. There was really no, no Baha'i administrative basis in the state. There was no Baha'i community life to speak of before this outburst of growth. So, of course, it was impossible to sustain it. And I confess that as I first started the research that became No Jim Crow Church, I basically shared the same view, just because I didn't know any better. Um, I thought that maybe my book would have an introductory chapter about what happened in the 1960s, or maybe even push it back to the 1950s, but that was about it. Um, and of course, instead, what I found was that the community's history in South Carolina goes back almost to the faith's arrival on American shores. Indeed, that, that the imperative to spread the faith in the South and to make it, uh, and to do so on an interracial basis, this was a good portion of the clay from which the Baha'i movement in North America was molded from the beginning. And so I think that what No Jim Crow Church demonstrates and what my future work will confirm is that the large-scale growth that happened after 1968 was only possible because of how much experience in interracial community building and, and the administrative structures that were put in place that the South Carolina Baha'is had been doing uh, all during the Jim Crow era. Um, now, all of this is fine, um, but an important question is, why is this relevant today? I'd like to, to speak a little bit to that as well. Um, I mean, interesting as all this is, how is this not just the story of one tiny, obscure religious movement? Frankly, in a state as overwhelmingly Christian and Protestant as South Carolina is, how much of a big deal is it anyway to be the largest religious minority? Um, well, in this vein, I recall something that uh, one of my mentors in graduate school shared uh, quite a while ago. She said, 
that given everything that we know about the sordid history of race relations in the United States, any group of whatever size or duration that really attempted to practice racial equality is worthy of study. And I would say that that, that advice rings even truer uh, today. Um, let me just change slides and I'll show you another, another picture. This is one of many groups uh, that attended programs, educational programs at the Lewis Gregory Institute um, close to where I was born um, here near Hemingway, South Carolina. This is a group um, that's really attempting to put racial equality into practice. Um, so, so when have vital questions of race and religion and economic justice and identity and our country's place in the world been thrust more forcefully into our collective consciousness? When recently? Um, the election of the first president of African descent in 2008 and the various kinds of opposition that elicited the wave of protests and soul searching surrounding police brutality and criminal justice, particularly in African American communities that started with the murder of Trayvon Martin in 2012. And needless to say, this most recent national election process and the social and political chaos that I think it's fair to say is far from over. All of these should serve to highlight that the social consensus, the, the whatever moral underpinnings that have held this big and diverse country more or less together are, are under terrible strain, uh, to say the least. We see mistrust and suspicion and resentment on every side. We see the spread of toxic ideologies. We see leaders appealing to base passions and fears. We see a collapse of meaningful social discourse. We can readily bring to mind Baha'u'llah's dire assessment. They hasten forward to hellfire and mistake it for light. And to be clear, I mean, we didn't get together to talk about the recent elections, but I think we should frankly acknowledge that there these are forces that have been at work in our country for some time and this was never going to be pretty regardless of who won a couple weeks ago. Um, I am certainly not the only um, historian in the United States who has the feeling that for comparisons to where our country is today you really have to go back to the political upheavals of 1968 or even the Civil War and Reconstruction just to get a feel for what for what's happening right now. Um, and while we're at it, let's remember that there are similar forces that seem to be at work, um, indeed intensifying uh, in other countries as well, particularly in Europe today. Um, I don't think this is hyperbole or alarmism. It's certainly not meant as partisanship, but I think it is having our eyes wide open and trying to read or write the signs of the times. Um, of course, there are a number of passages in the Baha'i writings that speak to the historical processes that are at work in the world, um, and including this moment. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of Shoei Effendi's letter to the American Baha'is in the middle of 1954, um, at a particularly dark time in the Cold War that, uh, that carries the title American Baha'is in the Time of World Peril. And if you'll permit me, here's, here's an important bit. Excuse me just a second. <clears throat> the American nation of which the community of the most great name forms as yet a negligible and infinitesimal part stands indeed from whichever angle one observes its immediate fortunes in grave peril. The woes and tribulations which threaten it are partly avoidable, but mostly inevitable and God sent. For by reason of them, a government and people 
clinging tenaciously to the obsolescent doctrine of absolute sovereignty and upholding a political system manifestly at variance with the needs of a world already contracted into a neighborhood and crying out for unity will find itself purged of its anachronistic conceptions and prepared to play a preponderating role as foretold by Abdul Baha in the hoisting of the standard of the lesser peace in the unification of mankind and in the establishment of a world federal government on this planet these same fiery tribulations will not only firmly weld the American nation to its sister nations in both hemispheres but will through their cleansing effect purge it thoroughly of the accumulated dross which ingrained racial prejudice rampant materialism widespread ungodliness and moral laxity have combined in the course of successive generations to produce and which have prevented her thus far from assuming the role of world spiritual leadership forecast by Abdul Baha's unerring pan a role which she is bound to fulfill through travail and sorrow somehow 60 years does not seem like a long time ago uh, in reviewing that passage now we certainly don't have enough time today to talk in depth about Baha'i understandings of history the place of the United States in the world um, but I do think that there are some lessons from the Baha'i experience in South Carolina and more broadly around the country that stand out um, and I can just share a few thoughts uh, drawn from my research and, and experience in the field. So, one thing is that um, Baha'is have been working to build interracial fellowship and to break down barriers between people in this country for a very long time and sometimes suffering greatly for it. Um, the national Baha'i community's record isn't perfect. The South Carolina Baha'i community's record is certainly not perfect but I think there's a lot um, for us to be proud of and to be inspired by and I think that Baha'is should be um, maybe this isn't the right word should be armed with this history right so that so that they should have no qualms sharing about um, more than a century worth now of struggling to build new kinds of community in in, in whatever forum we enter um, with whoever wants to know. We have real experience that's genuine and worthwhile that we need to be familiar with and, and able to articulate and, and share with others because other people are looking for models and for something to inspire them uh, as well. Another point that I would uh, raise is that the Baha'i approach to interracial community building is in some ways harder and I would suggest more radical than what most other thinkers or organizations have really conceived or attempted. <clears throat> putting, putting social equality first, doing this consistently with all of its ups and downs for more than a century in hundreds of localities across the South and across the country has frankly put the Baha'i faith on the cutting edge of radical social action in the United States regardless of how Baha'is may feel looking at you know the just shortcomings of the past or the or the the progress we feel we still have to make a half century after the high point of the civil rights movement there are still a number of ways in which the United States is quite segregated by race and class particularly um, and we don't have time to, to uh, uh, there's all kinds of statistics that, that that I could share I don't think there's really time but particularly when you look at residential patterns um, the uh, trends in the education system and religious practice um, these are all areas in which um, s some progress has been made but um, but by and large uh, the country remains um, um, nearly as segregated as it was uh, uh, 50, 60 years ago. Um, and 
the effects of these persistent patterns of segregation in the way our communities are built, like literally built, um, the effects of this on public policy, and even, as I think we're uh, uh, becoming clear about, on the public's perceptions of reality are, are huge. So this work of, of promoting social equality is still very relevant and very necessary everywhere in the United States. Um, I think another big point <clears throat> that the South Carolina experience and, and elsewhere um, illuminates is that in the Baha'i approach to social change, the ends do not justify the means. And this really goes to the heart of, of Baha'i idea and uh, the practice and, and, and ideas of what makes what makes the Baha'i faith. Um, the, the ends and the means have to be in harmony with each other at every step of the way. In other words, if we want a, a country or a world of unity and justice, then every action we take and every word we say has to manifest unity and justice. Now this is one way of understanding why, for example, Baha'is have not taken up arms in pursuit of their aims and can't, can't really work with people who do. Um, why Baha'is have to avoid involvement or even the, even the appearance of involvement with political parties or candidates and why we have to be awfully careful what we say about those who want to get elected to office or who do get elected to office. Why Baha'is simply can't engage in rhetoric that demonizes one sector of society or another. Um, the House of Justice has recently pointed this out in a, a seminal letter to the Baha'is in Iran in 2013. Um, this has sometimes meant that others have perceived the Baha'is as naive or as overly cautious or conservative. But I think those are all misreadings of the faith's very challenging teachings about the nature of social change, the nature of governance, and, and the nature of power. Um, we can see this um, not just in Iran, of course, but I think in South Carolina and the United States, our, our history shows this as well. Um, <clears throat> another thing I'd like to talk about is this, um, this notion that comes from Dr. King of the beloved community. Uh, this, this future society that would be characterized by love and justice and the total interrelatedness of all things, as, as he said. Um, Baha'is in South Carolina and elsewhere have been engaged in a long-term process of breaking down the very ideas and structures of oppression by recreating the hearts of both the oppressed and the oppressor. And this is at the heart of Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolent civil disobedience. It's at the heart of the, the ideal of the beloved community that he said was the ultimate goal of the civil rights movement. But I think it's important to point out that too few organizations have given enough attention to, uh, to implementing the beloved community. The fact is, it's really hard work, the most important work, to get blacks and whites and everybody else to really think of themselves and act as, as members of one family. Because of what, we're, what we learned in South Carolina and elsewhere, um, today, Baha'is are putting their energy into a program of grassroots community education that nurtures the capacity of astonishingly diverse participants, particularly children and youth, to be able to understand their social environment and to take up lines of action that serve the greater good, neighborhood by neighborhood. This is a long-term endeavor that seldom makes headlines. It, it hasn't and it probably won't for a long time. But it stands at the very heart of the kind of meaningful and lasting social change that the country is obviously so desperately in need of. I think what's urgently required right now is a concerted effort 
to make sure that the rising generation has the intellectual and social tools and most importantly the, the moral sensibilities, the moral compass to create, to live in the beloved community. And I venture to say uh, that, that given everything we know, uh, the Baha'is in South Carolina and around the country are ready to step up their game uh, accordingly. Um, I think I'd like to leave it at that for now. Um, I believe that there are some questions by now. I'd like us to um, have some discussion, uh, if, if possible. I'll leave you with the, uh, another shot of the, that initial slide. Um, so I wonder if there have been some questions that have come in. Yeah, we have some questions. Thank you, first of all, Louis, for an incredible presentation. Um, very impressed. And uh, if people want to know more about the book, heck, they can read the book. Um, but having a discussion of the book's implications, of the book's uh, of the misunderstandings that the book is correcting, uh, I think is particularly useful and gives us a real sense of the, the, the sort of the purpose of the book and what we can learn from the information that it presents. So thank you so much, really. It's really very exciting. Sure. Uh, we have a question here. First of all, uh, Reggie up in Canada, good to see Reggie's uh, comments here, asks this question. Please comment on the use of the word church in the title of your work. Um, well, you know, I've never named a book before. This is my first experience, so now I know a little bit about the way it works. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so the idea um, of of a Jim Crow church uh, comes from a discussion in the book um, about really Shoei Effendi trying to guide um, the Baha'is in their, um, the, the concerted southern campaign that started in the late 1930s with the first seven-year plan um, in, in North America. You know, in, in, for, for decades, um, the, the national Baha'i community meant um, a few cities and towns in the, the Northeast and the Great Lakes region and on the West Coast in California. Um, and vast stretches of North America, um, the South, uh, the Intermountain West, um, the, most of Canada, Alaska, um, were just empty of Baha'is. So when the first global uh, teaching plan, I mean, it was the, the first North America teaching plan uh, started in 19, 1937, um, expansion into the South figured very prominently. Um, because of the faith's teachings about the oneness of humanity and the specific implications for the United States, this meant that the, the Baha'i community was going to have to confront Jim Crow um, much more broadly um, in, in many locations at once um, <clears throat> than, than it had before. Excuse me. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and so there were real operational questions about you know, it's, so when um, pioneers, uh, Baha'i settlers from the Northeast, from Chicago, from wherever, are going to show up in relatively small cities and towns in the Deep South and try and attract people um, to the Baha'i teachings, how do they do so without getting themselves hurt and without getting the, the interested parties hurt? How do you create um, little nuclei of, of interracial uh, interracial Baha'i communities, um, given that no church in the region had the experience of doing so. Um, so, so that's that's where the the title comes from. Is is this uh, this central discussion as the faith is expanding in, in the deep south of how how do we make sure that the faith will not emerge as some just like the churches. Just like um, Christian, you know, Protestant, uh, Protestantism is the by far the dominant faith in the region. Um, Roman Catholicism, Judaism, they they basically follow suit. Um, that where where in the same denomination there are black and white members, then it's in separate compartments. 
and they don't worship together, they don't interact socially together. How can we avoid that and make sure that the faith grows on a different, a different basis? So it seems to, um, it seems to encapsulate um, one of the central concerns um, of of the time period. So I, I don't know. I hope it works as a title, uh, Reggie. I, yeah, I think it's a great title myself. And let me ask you this follow-up question. Was there a quotation where you got the title, or did it just simply occur to you? Sometimes people find this perfect quotation in their research. No, I, I, I wish I could say, oh, yeah, that was straight out of Shari Effendi's mouth. But no, it's, it's, oh, no. it's, it's, it's more like a paraphrase. Um, th there are several letters in, in the 30s where, um, where, where this, is, this is kind of the, the question. And, and even, and even um, up until the 1950s, um, there's the, there's still um, such difficulty that these communities have, and and uh, the structural barriers, especially to white Baha'is being able to reach out to uh, to African Americans. It's just uh, it's it's such complicated territory. Um, so so Shoghi Effendi's coming back to the same themes again, really until uh, until the last few months of his life, and. And I have to, I have to admit, um, this is this is one of I think the the um, one of the facts that we have to face, you know, squarely, is that by the end of Shoghi Effendi's life, the the progress in the Deep South had been so slow that, as I read those last letters on the subject to the to the National Spiritual Assembly, um, well, you know, they're letters, but. I, I hear Shoghi Effendi's voice screaming, desperate almost, that the Baha'is move out so much faster than any of the other groups that are working with for, for racial justice, um, that are working to, to, uh, to, to, to bring down Jim Crow. He said the, the burden is even more on, on you um, to be in, in the forefront. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't until a few years after his death uh, that I think the sort of movement that he really called for that he, he had been consistently calling for it, it didn't take off uh, uh, unfortunately until after he wasn't around to see it. Well, it's, it's still exciting to hear that the idea no Jim Crow Church does come is inspired by the writings of the Guardian. That's not something I had expected to hear. Thank you for that. Malii up in Chicago asks, from a cultural perspective, what are your thoughts about a large number of people coming from outside South Carolina for this Pentecost? At a recent Baha'i community gathering in Chicago, a practice, we discussed the impact of engaging people with the teachings of the faith in ways that engage folks racially, ethnically, nationally, and linguistically. Um. Uh, I, I'm, well, I'm delighted to hear that, that 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 came up in Chicago. I think one of the things, one of the things um, about the the current phase of 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 the work of the faith in in North America is that um, on some scale or another, now local communities, geographic clusters across the continent are experiencing some of the same challenges uh, that, that that came. All at once, in an explosion in South Carolina in 1970. Now, now, every now we're all in the same boat. Um, so, welcome to the family. Here we are trying to figure this out. Um, I, I, I take some wisdom from I mentioned it earlier, Century of Light, and I would strongly suggest um, I go back to Chapter Nine of Century of Light over and over. Um, and I don't have uh, I don't have it uh, right at my fingertips. Um, but when in describing um, the large scale growth that took place in the Deep South and, and other places around the world in the 60s and 70s and onward, the, the comments um, you know, commissioned by the House of Justice in, in in that document are basically that there was no other way to learn what the Baha'i community needed to learn except to have done what they did. I mean, it, maybe it sounds kind of simplistic, but I think it's an important point that, that how else are we going to figure out um, how, to, how to work with various different populations? How else are people going to be able to bring 
their gifts and their experiences into the work of the my community, except to except to do it and to keep an open mind and to to keep an an open heart about it, right? Um, so there's this. Of course, I mentioned there's this this kind of uh, line of thinking in the American Baha'i community that says, you know, the teaching was great, but there was no consolidation, which I uh, I, I suggested is a, a misconception. Um, but the fact is, we have a great deal more tools. Um, we have a great deal more experience of um, how to open the doors of the Baha'i community for a broad participation by all kinds of people who are interested. We have, we know a lot better how to do this now than we did in 1968 or in 1975. Um, and the, the framework for action, I think it's important to, for us to remind ourselves that our national community, especially through this experience in the Deep South, we helped, we helped to create this current framework for action. So it's ours. We might as well use it, embrace it, um, do it. The only <laughs> the only way to learn how to do it is is in execution. I hope that doesn't sound like a simplistic answer, because um, it because it's really about where the rubber meets the road. Um, specifically, though, in terms of you know the people from outside um, come into South Carolina. Um, because I think the analogy now is people from you know one neighborhood in a cluster engaging with another neighborhood, a kind of across boundaries of class and race and ethnicity and so forth, perhaps. Um, how else are you going to do it? A lot of the people who came from elsewhere to South Carolina stayed for a short time or for a long time. A lot of them buried their bones here. Um, a lot of people from South Carolina uh, who, who became Baha'is left and went other places to Chicago and to Minneapolis and to, I could name a whole bunch, um, and sort of brought some of this sensibility um, elsewhere. So um, I guess I would have to say that then and now, so long as we're actually using the tools that are available to us, so long as we're sincere, um, and so long as the, the 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 big picture effort is to make sure that everybody who's interested gets to bring their gifts to the table, and that the that the whole Baha'i community is is open to change, I don't see how you can really go wrong, regardless of what the particular circumstances are in the cluster. Thank you. Uh, Shahla asks this question: Is it fair to say? that a major and perhaps positive result of recent events in our country is to make apparent the extent of racial inequality and prejudices that still exist in this country. Um, I would, yeah, I would, I've been thinking that this is a good case of um, uh, WWSED, uh, what would Shoghi Effendi do? Um, you know, how, how would how would the Guardian assess this situation, right? What would the Guardian say were uh, were the the responsibilities and opportunities of of uh, the American Baha'is? Um, so so yes, I, I I think it's I think it's very fair to say that given his broad assessment of crisis and victory and his broad assessment of the, the interplay between the greater plan of God and the lesser plan of God, you know, what are we supposed to do is just take advantage of every chance that opens up. So, I, I mean, I would, I would think that one of the, one of the functions of white supremacy or one of the effects of white supremacy, as Dr. King uh, said it, what is to teach white Americans that they have very little to learn. So I think, if nothing else, what's been all this churning 
in the United States over the past few years, and certainly it seems to be accelerating, um, is serving to remove a lot of blinders from a lot of eyes. Um, so who, who is there to, to help guide this process, to help be midwives for this process, for, for all kind of folk who are seeking integrity and can't find it, seeking truth and can't find it, um, seeking um, community that works and that satisfies and that fills, can't find it, you know, seeking, um, seeking a home for their children and, and can't, can't seem to, to find it. Um, yeah, do, doesn't it seem like opportunities are, are around every corner, you know, everywhere uh, we look. When, when's the last time, I mean, in, I'm 40, in, in my lifetime, I can't think of a moment when more Americans have been, like, really genuinely thinking about governance like deeply about like what are the what are the dynamics of power what what does the political party party system mean like who's in charge of things and how does this affect my life and maybe we should do things in a completely different fashion well yeah i suggest Baha'is have quite a few things to say on on such a subject now we you know we need to think carefully about how we talk about these things um uh, let's not cause more trouble um, than than the country already has. Um, but no, I think uh, not to be crass, not that we're trying to take advantage of misfortune, but misfortune is happening. It's going to happen. It's been happening. It's going to happen more and more. Um, this, this is what we do. Yeah. Paul asks this interesting question. Uh, can you share any implications for Baha'is supporting the Standing Rock confrontation. And I should add, of course, that this is the time right now of a national uh, prayer period of time to support Standing Rock. I believe it's going on right now r across the country. Um, yeah, I, you know, I've been, I've been doing my best to follow, follow the news there, um, like I guess most everybody has. Um, <clears throat> and I think we should remember in this context, I'll just say a couple things, that um, you know, as, as, far as, as far as we know, um, there were Baha'is that showed up at just about every major civil rights demonstration that you can think of, um, at least in individual capacity. Um, and a lot of civil rights action that, that you haven't heard of, that most, you know, not the famous stuff. Um, in Greenville, South Carolina, in 1964, um, there was uh, a court order at the state level uh, that uh, resulted in the closure of state parks um, in, in order to forestall desegregation. So instead of desegregating the state parks, the, the state government chose to just shut them all down. And, uh, and the city of Greenville decided to do the same thing so that their swimming pools wouldn't have to be uh, wouldn't have to be integrated. Um, and in Greenville, this tiny little Baha'i community, um, without being partisan, um, they showed up to all of the meetings of city council. They put um, uh, editorials in the newspaper um, to, to, to specifically protest uh, this action. Um, and they, they called people to, you know, principal as they did so. Um, it was a very thoughtful response by a tiny community. Hmm. Um, and then they also, at the same time, they contributed to trying to change the atmosphere in the community. They worked with, um, with a number of, of non-Baha'i friends and contacts to put together um, what they called a, a spiritual singing convention. Hmm. And so they brought all kinds of, of black and white um, musical groups, Christian, mostly Christian, there were also Baha'is, um, and, and some speakers, um, there was somebody from the, um, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Reverend James Bevel, um, a number of people to, to, to try and, um, uh, to try and encourage the civil rights movement locally, right? So I take that as an example of local action, you know, in the context of my cluster, 
in the context of my area, like what what are the opportunities that uh, that Baha'is see because because we're active and involved in our communities, mm -hmm. um, in the local discourses that are taking place. Um, I think opportunity should open up um, uh, all over the country um, for specific kinds of actions around specific kinds of issues that help us to, to build bridges and, and, to, and to change the environment. And, and I know that Baha'is have been involved at Standing Rock uh, since the beginning as well. Um, I think also uh, 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 something to glean from this uh, U.S. Baha'i civil rights history is that there are times when um, when um, when national level discourse and national intervention um, from the National Spiritual Assembly is is, uh, is appropriate as well. And so I don't know in particular um, uh, what what uh, what the implications may be um, at Standing Rock, but that certainly seems like something that's um uh, that's certainly not just a cluster level activity, if you ask me. Yes. Nabil asks this question, what sort of organized Baha'i social initiatives can we audaciously pursue today that will continue the work that is needed in our community and systematic social reforms needed, given, given the challenges we see in society today and the rising dialogue with around us so that we can see as in the for, can be seen as it being in the forefront of people addressing persistent prejudices? Um, so, so I guess I would have to say that, um, so, so from my research and from my own like personal impression of, of, of working in the field, I, I think it has to come back to the framework for action and primarily that work is at the level of the cluster and what kind of opportunities emerge at, 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 at that grassroots level. Um, and so no, I don't think there's a whole lot that anybody not from your cluster can say about what, what y'all ought to be doing and, and, and vice versa, right? The more, as the House of Justice has said over and over again, the more we're actually involved with our friends and neighbors and, and learning more about the circumstances of the lives of the people that, that we love, um, then, then it becomes clear what the next step is and the step after that, and, it, and we don't end up... Um, with a cookie cutter approach that okay well this has worked in another cluster and so here's a program that I'm gonna you know kind of impose on on the situation here that being said um, I think the framework for action has within it the the seeds of of a wide variety of social action um, I think the most audacious thing that we can do across the board is advance the junior youth spiritual empowerment program. Um, I think we have a crisis in education everywhere. I, I don't imagine there are a whole lot of communities that can say, no, 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 never mind, we don't have a crisis in education. Um, I, don't think, I don't think that there are many places in the country where you can't find lots of parents concerned about their children, teachers concerned about the young people that they work with. And I think that that if we really understand the the principles and the and the application of the Junior Youth Spiritual Empowerment Program, um, then I think that that we we bend every energy, you know, given our individual circumstances, but like whatever I can do um, to to help advance that in my own cluster and, and more broadly. That's, that's where I put my energy because that's a truly revolutionary kind of concept and the application of it is really impressive. And it's those young people, their animators and, and the, the, the junior youth in, in the program who are, who, as I look around the country, they're at the forefront of racial healing. They're at the forefront of starting to think of getting young people to think about issues of justice mm -hmm. and class and power and um, and what what a socially thriving neighborhood ought to look like, and how do groups of people learn to work together to to advance uh, the process of of a neighborhood's development? I think that's some of the most exciting stuff that that we could 
possibly want to be involved in. Um, and I think it's about letting, uh, letting the, the innate sense of justice and the innate creativity of these middle school age young people, um, letting it, letting it go, you know, helping to channel it and following them into whatever, whatever the projects are that, that they choose. Um, and, and, and removing whatever roadblocks the rest of us can um, to, to their success. And the more we build up as a national Baha'i community, I think, but cluster by cluster, the more we build up experience in that regard, I think that's something that, that actually does have the, the potential to, to attract broad attention. Um, and it has in some clusters where that, that program is most advanced. Um, but we don't, we don't have quite enough of a track record yet I think to be able to open it up and say to you know all the political leaders all over the country here, give us your children. We don't have quite that much experience, um, but but let's. Um, I think we really got to focus on getting it. Interesting, Christine. Actually, I, in some ways, you may have already answered her question. How did the Baha'is in South Carolina, South Carolina respond to incidents of oppression by state and church? And what approach to public discourse do you think should Baha'is take today? Some ways you've covered this. So yeah, um, so so you know Jim Crow. Um, we don't really live in, in in Jim Crow America anymore. I mean, there's certainly there's it, it casts a long shadow, but specifically the kinds of uh, legal constraints that Baha'is dealt with, um, the kind of um, you know the degree to which the the police and the FBI and churches were all um, formally connected with upholding white supremacy it, 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 it really is different um, from 50 years ago and um, and anybody who says that you know nothing has changed in the past 50 years I'm sorry that's that's um, that that short changes the civil rights movement and as to paraphrase President Obama uh, last year when he spoke at the Selma uh, the anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March he said you know anybody who who says that nothing has changed, has forgotten what it was like before, right? Yeah. So we have to be good and sophisticated historians about this. Um, that said, um, Baha'is worked to find spaces within the Jim Crow system where they could practice their faith freely. And they did so sometimes very quietly, sometimes audaciously, um, it depends on the circumstances. So you have all kinds of experiences like um, um, when white Baha'is would go to the homes of black Baha'is for the 19-day feast or the local assembly meeting or whatever it was, um, that the, they, they could go to the front door. When black Baha'is came to the homes of, of white Baha'is in white neighborhoods, they came to the back door and you know as if they were servants so they, they they followed the social custom that's not the law that's a that, that's a custom but they did it in order to not draw undue attention then once everybody's inside hey you close the curtains and everybody is equal and whites and blacks are serving each other and so so they created spaces where they could literally created spaces to, to be able to um to, to, to practice equality, but sometimes they had to sometimes they had to to hide what they were doing just to make things a little bit easier. Um, they figured out ways to um to have public meetings that were racially uh, integrated, um, but they had to be kind of judicious about it sometimes. So so they would um they would have a newspaper uh, article, uh, advertisement in the, the church's section of the local newspaper, and they say, um, a meeting for, I'm thinking about Greenville, South Carolina. This is in the, in the 40s. Um, a meeting for the colored Baha'is and their friends will be held at such and such a time on Sunday. No, no this, is the way, this is the way they did it, the language of the time. The Greenville Baha'i meeting will be held at the home of such and such, a white person at 2:30 p.m. on Sunday. Um, a meeting for the colored Baha'is and their friends will be held at a different location at four o'clock. Right? The wording of it is ambiguous. It's on purpose ambiguous, so that 
it looks like it's two it's segregated meetings. It's two different locations, but it says colored Baha'is and their friends, which means well, their friends could be white, right? And the Greenville Baha'i meeting, okay, anybody who wants to think that's a segregated meeting, they can think that and not show up with the police. Thank you very much. But anybody who wants to come, you know, they they will could also figure out that you know that that black blacks could could come to that as well. So um, so some of that is the is the the, the subtle things that they did. That's clever. Um, yeah. Um, they but they also you know did um, uh, public events with with speakers you know guest speakers and so forth that were pretty forthcoming um, about about the Baha'i principles. Um, there were uh, efforts in various cities to to uh, to secure a prominent hotel that's usually segregated, but um, extract concessions from the management somehow that well we're going to have Negro guests and you know we want you to accommodate Negro guests and you know that you know there's there's no reason for you not to do so because because it's it's the choice of the owner uh, the the law doesn't mandate segregation in hotels usually it's the it's the choice of the owner so somehow they're able to like kind of put put a get a foot in the door. Uh, and open up some of these public venues. Um, so they did all kinds of things. Um, I think today, you know, different conditions pertain. And so cluster by cluster, locality by locality, it's going to take... The principle is, I think, that at every stage of the face development, it takes a sophisticated reading of the local social reality, right? Like, where do we live? Where do the people live? What are the institutions and agencies at work in this, in this locality, in this cluster? What are the barriers between people? What are the problems? Like, it's, it has to be, a, I think, a local approach looking, looking out from the cluster at what the, what the barriers are today in our particular, in our particular areas. So I don't think there's, a, um, there's, a, there's not a, a, a template to follow, right? But there is this principle that you look at the situation that you're in and you work it. You know, you 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 do everything you can to, to push. And try not to get yourself killed, right? And try not to get your seekers killed. Because that sort of obviates the the, the whole endeavor, right? Um, I, that you know, when you're subject to violence, um, and and when your when your Baha'i community in the whole country is so small, um, you know, maybe back up. Right, um, our community in the whole country is still awfully small. Um, so I don't think. Well, I, who knows what the next few years entail, really? Um, but, but I think wisdom and audacity uh, have to have to really work in tandem uh, with each other. And, and I think we can do that. Uh, but we've got different set of conditions, and maybe a whole different set of conditions coming down the. The pipe over the next four years, or who know? I, you know, I, excuse me. I, 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 again, I don't want to sound partisan, but I think we just have to have eyes open. You know, it's uh, these things have happened in in other countries. Uh, you know, Iran in 1978 sort of felt nervous too about what was coming. Right. Uh, you were running a bit out of time, I'd say. Uh, we still have a few questions left, and and I can summarize a few of them, and maybe we can sure. wrap up in a few minutes. Uh, Deborah wants to thank you very much for giving voice to this aspect of our Baha'i history now. I am most grateful that as a person with South Carolina background reflecting on this, I was a witness and hope for application in my neighborhood. All so right. that's very, very nice. And Malie up in Chicago has another question for you. What do you suggest as a response to those who say that interracial and anti-racism work is political and to be avoided and that faith Prayer and teaching the faith is our most potent response. Yeah, boy, I wish I had like some kind of great prepackaged wisdom for that one. Um, I mean, you know, <laughs> I am a Baha'i in the United States at this moment too, trying to figure out what <laughs> what are the circumstances in which we find ourselves at this moment, um, and how do we talk about governance? How do we talk about the the social, the moral ties that that should bind communities? 
how do we talk about you know processes of decision making? How do we talk about the oneness of humanity and its implications in ways that in, it, we're in this hyper partisan environment where you know it's kind of, uh, if you're like me sometimes you're just sort of reluctant to open your mouth at all for fear of uh, misunderstanding. So um, so. I, so I, I don't have any 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 particular wisdom except to it, I hope this doesn't sound trite, but I think we have to learn it as we go in every cluster. I think that one one thing that might be helpful is in this regard is to focus on local concerns. It might be easiest to find partners it might be easiest to avoid uh, the appearance of partisanship or the fact of partisanship at the local level where oftentimes you know partisan disputes are not are not as pronounced depends on where you are um, but I, I think I, there's 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 a lot in me that says that that the local level the cluster level is in a sense um, the House of Justice has said that's the most important arena anyway that's where most of us should be concerning ourselves, but at this time, it also makes it feels like to me the cluster level is a is a safe a safer um, place to pursue connections and to and to help raise the level of discourse. Very interesting. Um, my friend Robin up in Boston asks a very challenging question for you. Please explain why you disagree with the idea that consolidation during mass conversion was a failure. Oh, Robin, I've, I've got this, there's, how much time do we have? Um, so that's the, um, that's really the subject of, of my next big book, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on fleshing it out. And we'll certainly have you for a web talk on it, too. Yeah, yeah, you bet. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be ready, and it, it'll take a few years, but sure. Oh, yeah. Um, so just briefly, I, I, I think I think one way to think of it that is helpful to me is that um, what the what the Guardian called for, you know, towards certainly towards the end of his life, and what the Hands of the Cause and what the Universal House of Justice directed the Baha'is to do, starting really in 1964, was to consciously bring whole populations close to, towards Baha'u'llah, towards the teachings, towards the faith. I think if, the, if you know, in, in, in that big picture approach, um, we have to be careful what we call, you know, successes and failures, right? Um, the House of Justice, you know, in, in Century of Light, says there was there was no other way to learn what what we had to had to learn. Um, this is not to say that the hopes and expectations in 1970 weren't perhaps grandiose. Perhaps I, I think that it turned out to be harder to build new local Baha'i communities in so many places at once than anybody really had had an inkling of when, when the whole thing started. Um, but there were hundreds or maybe thousands of people who did arise as protagonists of the faith. There were thousands of children who experienced some degree of Baha'i education and have now gone on to all kinds of walks of life. Um, um, because the faith penetrated families in South Carolina more than, than anywhere else on the continent because of the impact of Radio Baha'i since 1985. Um, the, the public awareness of the existence of the faith in South Carolina is higher than anywhere else in North America. Um, the, the, the number of people who just in this area, you know, it's, it's so common for me, anecdotally, to say I'm a Baha'i and for, just to, for random people to say, oh yeah, my grandmother was a Baha'i, I went to Baha'i 
those classes when I was young? Um, do you still have the Baha'i Center on Evans if you know, here in Florence? Um, oh, I remember the Lewis Gregory Institute. The last time I was there, Lewis. Um, the last time I was at the Lewis Gregory Institute, Dizzy Gillespie was there. Um, it, these experiences are are so real, um, just because all twenty thousand of those people um, don't show up to unit convention. Um, doesn't mean the whole thing was a waste of time. Um, that's 20,000 more people that know something about the Baha'i Faith and maybe did something to contribute yeah. than, than there were before. And, and I'll take it. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess personally, I would say I became a Baha'i when I first heard, heard about it on, on Radio Baha'i. Um, so if it hadn't been for those consolidation efforts, um, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. Um, and so, I, I, so I, I personally <laughs> am not in a position to, to to call it a failure either. But I, I but think, I think the correlation of it, you know, it's I mean that that it's it really is going to take a whole other book even to get started. Yeah, well, I think you made a good point. You know, when we have a million and a half Baha'is in the United States instead of 174,000, we'll no doubt be lamenting that they're not active enough, uh, that there are too many of them that you know, aren't involved in conventions and feasts and such and you know the Catholic Church cannot uh, try to create a database of all their members in the United States like we do and uh, they certainly wouldn't be able to maintain the addresses and most of the people wouldn't bother to change them you know mm -hmm. so I, I agree with you there uh, so, I'm surprised that our interest is holding up so well I'm watching the audience attendees and that hasn't dropped any fact went up so I guess we can give a one or two more questions here uh, Bill okay. asks, do you think that the Universal House of Justice's emphasis on concentrated activity in neighborhoods is part of the process of social action and transformation across racial, class, and religious lines? Oh, heck yeah. Um, and, and, and they've, they've said so, um, which naturally I don't have uh, the quote that I'm thinking about. You know, right, right here, hold on. Um, wasn't this in... Uh, December 28, 2010. <clears throat> um, it should be apparent to all that the process set in motion by the current series of global plans seeks in the approaches it takes and the methods it employs. Let me, sorry, let me do that again. It, sh it should be apparent to all that the process set in motion by the current series of global plans is in the approaches it takes and the methods it employs. I think we can... The training institute, the, the approaches it takes, the methods it employs, seeks to build capacity in every human group with no with no concern to arise and contribute to the advancement of civilization. We pray that as it steadily unfolds, its potential to disable every instrument devised by humanity over the long period of its childhood for one group to oppress another may be realized. So, so, you know, I don't think we've got fortunately we've got for everything problem. that that ails the world. But yeah. I think it's us. Oh, excuse me. Can, can you hear me now? It was breaking Hello? up for a while, at least at my hey, end. I think it was. Yeah. Can you hear me? It was breaking up for a little while. Yep, here too. Yeah, you sound fine. Am I okay? Yeah, Boyd said you were breaking up there as well. Um, maybe we should move on to one more question. Are we still connected? Probably... Sorry? I, I, I think, what's the paragraph number? And then the person can look up the quote uh, later too. Maybe turn off your camera now. Oh, we lost him entirely. We haven't lost him entirely because we're still viewing the screen. I'm here. Okay, good. 
Um, shall we wrap it up then? I can move on and, and uh, perhaps talk I can, about... I can hear you, Rob. Okay, good. Um, we've still got actually quite a few other questions, but I think we're at the point now where we probably should end anyway because our audience is beginning to shrink. Let me thank you again, Louis, for this really fantastic afternoon. Uh, really marvelous uh, things to say uh, about the topic and all the implications for our future work. And uh, so I'll switch back to my computer here and I will uh, introduce us to the next set of, uh, uh, of uh, web talks. For those who, are, who want to know, we've got several coming up, and we have one more coming up on South Carolina, as you can see here. On January 17th is our next web talk, the first one in 2017. And Annette Reynolds, who is a Baha'i in South Carolina, will be talking about her book, Trudy and the Baha'i's Spiritual Path in South Carolina. So this is a chance for us to discuss the great successes and marvelous achievements of the South Carolina Baha'i community further. Then we have in February and March two talks which really in some ways are related to each other. Greg Dahl will talk about globalization from a Baha'i point of view of the of Baha'i faith. And then on March 12th, Hushmand Badi, a Baha'i in Britain with a PhD in economics, will talk about uh, the question, is there such a thing as a Baha'i economic system? Finally, in April, we'll have a series of four talks uh, the first one will be our official web talk. Todd Lawson will be talking about the Baha'i faith and the Koran and why it is that Baha'is should learn more about the Koran and appreciate it. Todd is a real expert on the Koran with a truly remarkable breadth of knowledge about it. He, of course, can read it in the original language. And he has a way of appreciating its poetry, its lyricism, its spiritual depth that I think you will find very inspiring and really quite remarkable. We'll also be doing talks on April 9th, 16th, and 23rd um, from him, and I'm not yet sure whether we'll just make them all free talks or, or not. I haven't, we haven't figured that part out. It may be a course where there will also be some reading materials and the opportunity to discuss the whole thing further um, online um, via email and uh, web-based forums. And we, I hope we'll be able to do that, actually, because I think we'll get more out of them, and then the talks eventually will be made available to the public in six months to a year later. Finally, we have a whole bunch of courses coming up. Introduction to Shi'i Islam comes up uh, pretty soon. Uh, then we have our, first, uh, our, our last course on marriage and family life, creating unity with friendship, fun, social vitality, and laughter, the last one for 2016. We have quite a series, actually, in 2017. Then finding the hidden gift is your chance to learn about various ways of studying the Baha'i writings. You can understand metaphor and the various other aspects of the writings to be able to dig in and get a better sense of the meaning of the terms. Thinking of relationships and marriage will be the first marriage course of 2017. And then, of course, our schedule goes on. We had 53 courses in 2016. We're looking to do 54, 55 in 2017. So we have quite a lineup of courses for those who want to take them, and we are developing our lineup of web talks for 2017 as well. You can read more about all this at womaninstitute.org, our website. You can go to our youtube.com channel to watch this particular program once it's up, uh, probably in a day or two. We're going to be putting up the closed captioning eventually as well. That's now part of our standard. And by the way, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, you can watch this whole broadcast live on our Facebook page. We will be doing that from now on as well. So I want to thank everybody today for participating in our 10th Web Talk of 2016, and I look forward to seeing you all next year as well. Thank you very much.